Thank you everybody for attending. I'll stand behind here because the camera is uh, pointing in our direction. We've also got a packed room uh, of, uh, of one person here in, uh, in the school as well. So thank you very much for uh, attending folks uh, online. This is our 10th um, masterclass of the series in the new School for Business and Society at the University of York this year. And I think it will be the last one. So it's a, it's a real honor and privilege for us to have Laura Ibbotson uh, currently at Harris Group, uh, HR, head of HR at Harris Group UK, uh, to give her um, thoughts, opinions, experiences, and perspectives uh, on the topic of working parents, uh, something that affects, an issue that affects um, uh, so many of us. Um, Laura's been in HR for over 20 years. Um, she's got a, a degree and a master's degree, a first degree and a master's degree in HR. Uh, she's a fellow of the CIPD uh, and a qualified NLP coaching practitioner. Um, I know from chatting to Laura that she's got a, a range of uh, experiences also outside of HR, working at the strategy level uh, of international companies um, in uh, uh, various parts of, of the world. Um, and uh, probably no one's in a better position to link the international strategic HRM aspect to this as well, to, 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 to think about um, what we do with our employees, particularly the working parent side of our employees, to the strategies of companies. Anyway, really looking forward to uh, uh, Laura's presentation, and uh, we're going to structure it as follows. Um, we're going to go for about 20 minutes, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong Laura, That's fine. Um, for the main presentation, then for about 10 or 15 minutes, um, I've got some uh, questions, uh, sort of guided questions to run with Laura, and then after that we'll open it up for any of your questions, and please feel free to write questions into chat or turn on your microphones uh, when we get to that point. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming to today's session. And thanks for Laura. And uh, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's masterclass, which is going to be on Working Parents, presented by myself, Laura Ibbotson. I don't consider myself to be a master, but I do have lots of life lessons, personally, and business experience that I would like to share with you all. We have a variety of attendees today, so I've structured the discussion around parents, parents-to-be, businesses, future maybe parents, and carers. So an introduction to myself. I come from a small minor village in Barnsley. I'm the first person in my entire family to go to university. I had a career plan but not until probably the last couple of weeks when I was at college and I decided to combine my two passions which are people and business together and study for a HR degree. I knew from early on in my life that I did want children but I always had a plan personally that I didn't want them until I was the age of 30. Felt that was just right for me and that would give me time to experience life, develop a career. And I'm not saying that's what you should do, but that's what was right for me personally. I wanted to go to university and gain a successful career, despite not having much support as a child in regards to education, and to prove to not only myself, but others, that whatever you want to achieve in life is possible. So I attended Huddersfield University, which is where I gained my degree. It was CIPD accredited, which was the decision why, why I chose that university. I always wanted to do a master's, but I felt for me personally, it was best for me to go into industry, gain some experience, and then go back five years later and do my master's, which is what I did. And I felt that just worked for me. For the first 18 months of my career, I attempt and this was a great opportunity to take all the good parts from different businesses, all the different lessons learned and combine that in a, a very short period and it allowed me to excel quite quickly in my career. I've always had a passion for supporting people 
And I really hope that all of you can take something away from today's masterclass. I've always taken risks and I'm taking a risk right now, leaving my current company, Harris. So I've been with Harris now for four years. HR is really well respected. We have credibility. I know business inside and out. I have an amazing team and it, the HR department is functioning extremely well. So to leave a great business was a huge decision for myself. And I was in my interview and I was explaining to the CEO of my now new business that having two days a week to work from home and that, that allowed me to do the school run was of extreme importance to me. And the CEO just stopped me and said, you don't need to justify it. I get it. At which point I thought, right, okay, this is the right business for me. That's my new boss. As a parent, I constantly have mum guilt. I have business guilt. Trying to balance the two can be extremely difficult. My brother once said to me that, remember, pressure makes diamonds. So I try to remember that when I'm juggling a lot of priorities. So working parents, why did I decide today's topic? There are a number of reasons. I am a mum to two amazing daughters. And it's real important to me that I raise two independent, strong women and that they see both mummy and daddy equally provide for them. Parents face many challenges. You have schools and childminders finishing at times before the working day ends. You have child illness to deal with that in the middle of it. Parent guilt breaking careers and that can be for both mums and dads and this is where I say to employers your support and understanding is crucial financially which I think is probably the biggest pressure it plays on parents minds how big can their families be how many children can they have and it's just something that is never going to go away and that's where later in the presentation I'll talk about the government and what support they can introduce to it help support parents in business and also businesses. So there are three key areas that I would urge parents to consider when choosing an employer and also for businesses to consider in order to attract and retain key talent. So diversity and inclusion. In order to have a thriving, successful business, you need to have a wide range of skill sets. The way we achieve this is by attracting diverse candidates and retaining diverse employees. My caution to employers and candidates would be around authenticity. Check the employee's culture that they're selling you matches their cultural reality. And I'd say to businesses, don't spend all of your budget on marketing, forgetting about actually implementation and implementing what you're selling to the candidates. I also say to working parents that we have a responsibility to challenge behaviors in order to improve diversity, culture, to challenge stereotypes and to break down barriers. So what I mean by that, I had a conversation with a male director and it was around the school room, just a general conversation between the two of us. And he said, my wife does all of that. And I responded with, what, what, what do you mean your wife does all of that? Why? He said, because in my last business, they didn't support us to work from home or do the school run. To which I responded, well, you do now. If we don't challenge behaviours, nothing will change. How we behave now will shape the future generations and also future opportunities for working parents. If we do not improve the support available to working parents, more and more people will choose not to have children. And we have to consider how will that impact the economy? Where will it lead the population? What impact will that have on pensions and services available in the future? If you have a diverse business and inclusion for working parents, it's simple. You will attract the best people and retain them. If you work in a diverse business, you'll be happy, successful, and you will grow. 
Warren Talon, if you work in HR, work in recruitment, you will know right now how difficult recruiting and attracting talent, how costly it is, and how it can give you a business competitive advantage. If you get that wrong, that can be of extreme cost to the business. Offering flexibility and understanding to employees, especially with parental responsibility, is key. And it's not just about attracting new employees, it's also about retaining your current employees and looking at family friendly, family friendly policies, but also what can businesses do more than just the statutory minimum in order to attract and retain. Well-being. Parents must consider their own physical and mental well-being, not only to be a good parent and to, to perform in your role, but most importantly, we don't get a rerun at life. If you have a happy child, if you are happy, you'll have a happy child. And also remembering when you go out to work, what you're creating, you're creating opportunities, you're teaching children life lessons. My children have been lucky enough to experience amazing places in the world, and that wouldn't have been possible if I didn't work. So with that, that guilt, I try and remember the opportunities that it brings into my children's life that wouldn't normally be possible. I also would urge parents to have boundaries and don't have what I've done in the past 10 years where my children have just slammed my laptop shut and said, mummy, you work, you work too much. So my boundaries are that I walk through the door now and I don't do any work until 8 p.m. So that's family time. I'm not saying that you should do that, but personally, that's what works for me. Sometimes I'll log on, sometimes I won't. I'll do emails, I'll do project work, but it's what works for me and my mental health. And what I'd say to you is to figure out what works for you and of your family. Working from home and flexible working, COVID made this a necessity, but proof of continued performance has made it normal. And that's become of extreme importance when you're attracting candidates because more and more candidates will simply say, if you do not offer working from home, I'll not progress my application any further. Some businesses are wanting to return to the old ways where everyone is in the business, Monday to Friday, nine till five. These businesses will fail to attract key talent and ultimately will fail in the long run. So the government, the government plays a huge part in working parents' daily life. There are current support in place for parents and I'll, I'll quickly read some of those that are available. You have the free childcare for children aged three to four, 30 hours a week, child tax credits or universal credit, one-off payment of £500 for children born. Parents on universal credit can claim up to 85% of childcare costs. You have the usual maternity, paternity leave and pay. You have maternity allowance for people starting new roles, adoption, pay and leave, shared parental leave, which can be very complex. You also have tax-free childcare, which was the replacement of the old childcare vouchers, which closed in 2018. This is something that I personally use that we use in our family. So for every eight pounds you pay into your account, the government top it up by two pound and that can quickly add up to a substantial amount. You can use that for breakfast and after school clubs. As a family, we use it for summer clubs. So I'd urge you to check the eligibility because not all of this is available to everybody. The government are also introducing new initiatives from April, 2024. Parents of two-year-olds can access 15 hours of free childcare. From September 2024, children under the age of five will be entitled to 15 hours. And then from September 2025, the government are proposing that children under the age of five are entitled to 30 hours. The government have pledged to support providers and increase the rate paid to childcare providers to help them deliver the existing 30 hours. But I would ask, do we have enough providers and schools? We hear all the time about oversubscribed classes, 
poor Ofsted reports. I personally struggled to find childcare when my children were little and the cost to it can be significant. You'll hear a lot of parents say it, it's more than my mortgage. I believe there's an underpopulation time bomb ticking. Most benefits that the government offer are income assess and not readily available to all parents. And in this modern world that we live in, the current financial support is just out of date. The government constantly speaks about the need for innovation and growth without providing genuine, authentic support for parents to action the innovation and growth, it's simply not achievable. We've also got the cost of living affecting many families, and I believe the government has a duty to step up. The decision to become a parent should be a choice, and a choice the government is taking away from some would-be parents due to the lack of childcare provisions and financial support. My personal opinion is that the government should really step up and look at support for breakfast and after school clubs and that these should be offered by every single school in the country. They should provide financial support for child sickness and they should be asking parents what do they need and what do they require. So this moves me on to my next slide which is what can we learn from other countries? So one of my first experiences with my international colleagues when I started four years ago was a surprise at how much time they have off with their children and babies. And that's both, both parents, both mum and dad. And it was a culture shock because it's something I'm not used to. But have they got it right? Does our government need to take notice of our European countries? The proportion of part-time workers in the Netherlands, both male and female, is a lot higher than the UK. With most, most women and some in management positions part, working part-time, and that's just kind of a general rule. In the UK, it's pretty unheard of men working part-time. In Sweden, they have a really great support system that we could really, our government should really take notice of. Until a child is age eight, you have the right to take off 25% of your working week and the government and businesses cannot object to that. In Sweden, you get to stay at home for 60 days before you give birth, 80% of your salary. And then after you get 80% of your salary for 390 days, which is substantial compared to the UK. In Germany, if a child falls ill, they receive pay for up to 30 working days, 60 if they're a single parent. We don't have any of this support. As a UK parent, I felt extreme pressure, particularly when my children were younger. I would either have to take annual leave or unpaid leave, which can be really challenging, especially in the economy that we're living right now with cost of living impact. So, takeaways. I always think it's important when you go to an event or you attend something that you take at least one thing away. So these are just kind of my top tips. For business and HR and owners, some of the things that we've implemented at Harris, I will discuss in a second. I'd say to businesses, your support, your understanding is crucial. Parents have a lot to deal with day in, day out without having the pressures added in regards to whether it's they've needed to do the school run or their child's ill and need to make up their hours, just be flexible and have that understanding. At Harris, we support parents with special days, sports days, school plays. We ensure that they have the time to attend these events. We give them options when they do have child sickness, so we're not really strict with that. We give them that flexibility to work their time back, take it as holiday or unpaid leave. We've trained all of our managers on the family policy so that every manager has an understanding of each policy and how it applies and how they can support staff. We've introduced a pregnancy workshop, which was incredibly successful, where we had a, around four or five pregnant ladies that came together. We structured the workshop around giving it each other advice, addressing concerns, and offering each other support. 
We have also introduced a holiday buy scheme, which is something really simple. There's cost savings for the company from an NI point of view, but giving them an additional five days, should they choose to use things like childcare, school holidays, can be really successful. For parents, when you consider a new role, I would urge you to do your due diligence. Check what they're selling in the interview is actual reality. Enjoy every second of being a parent because it, it doesn't last forever. And something I stole from the, the Coca-Cola CEO, he said that life is around juggling balls and that three are made out of glass and one is made out of rubber. Your rubber ball is your work ball. Your glass balls are family, friends, and health. If you drop one of your glass balls, it smashes. The rubber one always bounces back. And my final note would be to say, my sister said to me when I had my children, they were very young and I was under a lot of pressure and stress and a lot of mum girl. She said, remember, the children will not remember every day, they'll remember their special days. And it's about making a special day special. And that's just something that personally helps me. So thank you very much for your time. And over to you, Chris, for some questions. Thank you very much, Laura. That was really interesting. And you've raised so many big topics in such a short period of time. People online have got lots of questions lined up. So let 10 minutes or so, if we could just um, cover a few of the things and cool. things that you that you mentioned. Um, uh, I, I think one of the things I think was really interesting was you talk about the, the, the marketing of HR. I know we didn't discuss this beforehand, but because you mentioned that, that when you go for a job interview, um, you know, the, the organization is, is marketing itself to you. Absolutely. And this is something that, that, that it's almost, there's a marketplace here. And, and I need to be interested in what this is going to mean for my, for my family life. Have you seen examples of good and bad practice as far as that marketing interface is concerned? Yeah, and that's where I say to you around the due diligence. I, previous to Harris, I, I went for a job. I was sold the absolute dream in the interview. And when I actually walked through the door, it was hell. So don't believe everything that's you told and sold in an interview. Do your due diligence. Find out if you know anybody that works that organization. Ask questions, ask more questions. And if your group tells you that something isn't right, you're probably right in considering a different role. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about the, the fact that we've got a mother and a father here uh, in, 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 this, in this equation? Because you did, you did raise that in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of instances. Um, you know, what, what are your views or what are your experiences on, on these different perspectives? Are they the same perspective? Are they completely different perspectives? Are, are we, um, you know, you know a, a male, you know, father's program to approach this, this topic differently to mothers? And, and if so, what, what does that mean? Any views on, on these differences? Yes, yeah, so I think through generations, things are changing, but the change is still slow. So you have a lot of men and women in typical traditional roles where you'll hear that they'll say, oh, my daughter's ill or my son's ill, my wife's gone to get them. And that's where I say to parents, we need to challenge that behavior. And in my business, I'll ask the male parents, why are you not picking the children up? Why are you not covering that sickness? And I think as a, as a mum, it's really important that we challenge our own personal behaviors and that we ensure that that parental responsibility is equal. The world is changing and a lot of women are now the breadwinners, but they're still expected to take on a lot of the home duties. And I think it's just a, a big cultural piece that will keep on evolving and changing, but there's still a long way to go. Right, right. Um, well, well-being comes up a lot uh, uh, as well and the role of the employer. You know, you've, you've mentioned that the employers do this marketing stuff and they can get it right and wrong and people can join your organization and be amazed or they can join your organization and be disappointed. Um, you know, what else can em, 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 uh, employers do to, to help? What, what, you know, what should employers be, um, you know, be thinking about? Should they have a continual sort of uh, self-reflection exercise in terms of their own HR practice? Should they do 
uh, surveys of parents within the organisations to get their opinions? What kinds of things do you think employers can do more? There's, there's lots they can do to gain feedback and understanding. It's about understanding what your working parents need and what not what you, the board thinks that they need. So you can do that through various sources. One would be your employee survey. So a couple of the questions could be around working parents or flexibility. But it's important if you're asking those questions, you're willing to action. You could set up different working groups, support. I think it's really important that employees support each other as well. And as a parent, it's very easy to forget the sleepless nights if you've now got a 10-year-old and it's just reflecting back and remembering different cycles of the life of a child. I was told the other day that small children, small problems, big children, big problems. And I think that, that is really true. And it's about not just the business supporting parents, but colleagues supporting each other as well. I think that's equally important. So you've got uh, almost a responsibility here at the employee colleague, you know, colleague level, not just as part of the formal HR, HR strategy. But does the organization, does the employer take responsibility for setting the culture? Uh, within the organization that allows people to feel that it's okay Absolutely. to talk about these issues. And... and that's why it's really important to understand that the most successful companies in the UK or across the world are the ones that do have HR on their board. And in my new role, I'll be group HR director for my new company, MGI. And having that voice, having that people voice, that people consideration into every single business decision or transaction is of extreme importance because we're all very good at what we do. So finance are very good at finance. You have procurement that are very good at procurement. HR are very good at HR and people. And it's imperative that you have that voice on the table at the top level. Right, and you can, you can influence the way the organization Absolutely. develops as far as this issue is concerned. Uh, Andrew is in the room, uh, might have a question. Yeah. And in the meet, while Andrew's asking his question, I'm just going to go onto Zoom to see if there's anything in the chat. So over to Andrew. Uh, I strongly believe that HR should be central to, to more important than finance, for, because as Richard Ramsden says, that if you want to look after your customers, just look after your customers, look after your employees. Um, and that is crucial for any enterprise. Um, so HR is, is a massive, it should be the center of every business. Um, and the fundamental part of uh, employees, that most employees will have children at some point. So it should be systematic. Uh, it, shouldn't, it, should, it should be a government initiative. Uh, Sweden, uh, Nor Norway, uh, Finland all have fantastic HR policies. They do. And they're right at the forefront of uh, employee happiness, uh, productivity, innovation. They're very small countries, but they're influenced in the world. Is that the world? Uh, and I'm a big believer in following this. So why why don't why don't Britain follow their example? I think there's a, a variety of reasons. I think cost plays a huge part in it. Some businesses will in some ways cut corners and look at where can they make cost reductions. I think it's a, a cultural understanding of what works and the changing world. You get some CEOs that are very forward thinking, very people focused and get it. And then you have the more traditional, what I would consider old school that do not understand that it's just quite simple. People are your business. If you don't invest in them, if you don't support them, you will not have a successful business. And it's that educational piece. And that's why I'm part of Make UK. I'm part of their regional board. And it's about having that voice and influencing at the right levels so I challenge a lot of those owners and a lot of those MDs and CEOs of, of their thinking because it is a change. It is a change from history where the mum stayed at home and she was the typical housewife. The world is changing and the successful businesses are the ones that change with a change of practice in regards to parental responsibility. So we've got three questions uh, in the chat uh, uh, so far. And um, let's go through these first, and then I'll open it up to see if anybody wants to turn on the microphone and uh, ask any questions and give their opinions. Uh, from Grace, I think this is Grace Foley. Do you believe COVID has had an impact on working parents and children? If so, what impact? Yeah, I think it's had a massive impact. 
from a mental health to a physical demand of working from home. Children now, or a lot of children have struggled mentally and they have separation anxiety. They want to know where the parents are, what time they're going to be at home. Some of them are suffering with social anxiety. And I think it's important to remember that parents are also dealing with that, something that we've never ever experienced or had to deal with before. And again, it's about that understanding piece and that support of acceptance that the world is a different place to what it was three, four years ago. And that parents are now facing challenges that none of us have ever experienced and that none of us were educated at university in. And it's important to understand what can we do to help that those parents, but also these children are our future leaders. They're our future engineers. And how will that impact the economy going forward? That you have a lot of children now wanting to stay at home and it's had an absolutely huge impact that I don't actually think has peaked quite yet. And I think there's a lot more of that to come. Very interesting uh, question. What about, you know, linked to COVID and, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the tendency to work more from home, which was, you know, many industries were going in that direction anyway, and COVID sort of accelerated that. Is that a good thing as far as working parenting is concerned? Uh, or is it a bad thing? We've all seen uh, these clips of Zoom meetings uh, from people's offices at home where a kid sort of jumps up in the background. Some of them are quite amusing. Um, but serious question, do, do, do you see it as a good development or not? Yeah, again, it's about having boundaries. My children are known to most managers in my business now because we've had the situations where they've come to the Zoom call with a pineapple in the hand asking me to put it back in lockdown. But it, again, it's about acceptance and understanding that the world has changed. And if you can facilitate a parent staying at home two days a week where they get to go do the school run, so them as parents are fulfilled and they have less skill and they work harder and they're more productive. For me, it's just a win-win. Not every role can work from home and not every role receives overtime. It swings and roundabouts and it's about having that balance and understanding that not every role is the same and not every rule will apply. Great, um, so question from Jessica, Jessica Hargreaves. Uh, you mentioned government policies in other countries. What are the gender differences in those policies in other countries? Any? In, 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 if I understand the question correctly, compared to the UK, I think there's just a, like for example, the Nordic countries, there's just a strong understanding and support function in place. So they understand the need to give parents options. And I think that's what our government limit. They don't provide the options available. They don't provide the financial support. And I think that's the difference. From a cultural point of view, I do think that our European countries are further ahead when we talk about that traditional role. I think the men in, for example, the Netherlands take a more active role in parental responsibility. When I'm over in the Netherlands, I hear a lot of men saying, I need to finish tomorrow early because I've got to go and pick the children up, or I'm off tomorrow because I work four days a week and that's my day with the children. So I think there's a, a cultural difference. Yeah, I, um, I had that experience in the Netherlands when I lived in the Netherlands and had, had young children too. Um, you know, that it, it wasn't unusual for the, for the father, me in this case, to, to, to leave work maybe three or so in the afternoon to get to the what they call the Kinderopfang, where the children were being looked up after after school, like an after school club. You know, their mother was continuing her daily, daily work. It wasn't unusual to see lots of dads there, you know, on bicycles uh, uh, or, or these sort of these big back feats, these bicycles with big boxes, you know, picking up the kids. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Jessica. Yeah. Andrew. Um, yes, therefore, parents need to travel. Uh, yeah, similarly, we have similarly as well. The first of eight, so it's much more male orientated. Um, yeah. It's involved right from the beginning. Yeah, yeah there's a more of a balance, I would balance. say. Yeah. yeah, it's just the balance. It's done by the government. Absolutely. And I think it's the, the so the, just for everyone in the room, the, we're talking here about maternal leave and paternal leave. I think that a lot of those policies have been pretty well established and equal in, in some of these countries, but for a long time. Some time. And I think the UK is beginning to catch up, but it's not 
it's not seen as being at the forefront. Yes, absolutely yeah. um, Thank you, Jessica, for that question. Uh, SK, uh, SK, uh, what do you think about the statutory pay levels family friendly league? I, I don't think it's enough when you look at the cost of living. A parent can go from a substantial salary and the drop is significant because our statutory levels are so low. So if we talk about the population and the potential for that impact in the future, the more and more we don't raise those statutory levels, the more and more people will decide not to have children. And I think the statutory levels are just very, very poor, especially when you look at other countries and the pay that they receive. And I think that's one of the main reasons that younger people today are being deterred from having families because they simply can't afford to drop from their current salary down to the statutory levels. And with the cost of living crisis, that Absolutely. only makes things only makes things worse. Uh, the data that I've seen relating to, and I'm sure many of us have seen on the news recently about you know the cost of living crisis. It's not only a, a recent thing. The, the levels of you know um, uh, you know uh, you know wage pressures that we face have been going on for a long time, if not if not decades. Thanks. Um, pushing the market to rent the market. Right. It's very expensive to buy property. Right. And it's kind of come to a head now with the current uh, inflation and high interest rates. Great question. Uh, Lisa, uh, since leaving the EU, has the UK maintained EU parenting policies or are we heading on a different direction to our European counterpart? Any thoughts on that? So the main, nothing has changed. The, the policies are, are still the same. Going forward, I think it depends on what government comes into play next time in the next general election. They hopefully will be a focus on parental support, but I do think that depends on which government is in power next. I think the key, the key point here under, under Lisa's question is the fact that we don't necessarily have to be aligned with the EU anymore. We, 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 we may be, we may not be. And, and that, that opens a risk as well, I guess, for many parents. Perfect. Um, any other questions there? Yeah. Oh, we've got another one from SK. Really interesting here, especially when lots of small businesses struggle to cope with the leave. Very difficult one to balance. Thank you. Right. Any other uh, questions from anybody in the room? Anyone want to turn your microphone on and uh, make any comments or points on this topic? Hi there. Hello, is that Katie? Hi, Katie, yeah, hi. Um, I was just typing out an, a question and it's it's something that we're struggling with in our business and it's it's how do we how do we balance the needs of kind of working parents with the needs of kind of younger people who need training in the workplace? Because obviously our our working parents are generally older and it's kind of how do we get that balance and maintain that kind of quality of people throughout the business. I'd be interested to hear Laura's thoughts because it's something we're definitely grappling with. So I, there's a number of issues that you can watch. One would be a, a mentoring or a, a buddy system. So it's something that we've introduced at Harris. So you look at your more experienced staff and your newer, younger staff coming into the business and a part of the two. And with working from home and that flexibility, we just lead them to decide the sessions that they meet at what time, what dates to suit them so that could be through teams that could be in person because everyone is different and everyone's got different learning styles and how we all learn is there's no kind of rule there's no black and white rule we also encourage um things just basics like documenting guides so you have a lot of old staff that you hear people saying oh if they left the business the business will be in trouble so in hr we wrote guides for everything so we can give them to our new staff We've got the, the coaching and mentoring policies in place. And again, I think asking your younger staff, what is it that they want? So again, not deciding what you think that they need, but asking how do they best learn? How do they want to develop? And what support they required from the more experienced members of staff? Sounds like this theme of... Um... You know, having employee participation and listening to your employees of, of different levels, the both the parents and the non-parents, 
is so important in all of this, yeah. rather than having a sort of top down, you know, CEO knows best kind of approach. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think that was Katie, right? Katie. Yeah, thanks, Laura. That was great. Any other thoughts or questions or experiences that anybody would like to share to add to the discussion? Yeah, I'm going to change the comment in Chile, just to change the comment. And I had three, the small team, three women, and they're all in childbearing age. And the four were curious that I've got three women that were all that had children. Uh, and lo and behold, they all had children at the same time. Uh, but it worked out brilliantly yeah, because by them having their time off their children, they were much more effective at the job we were working. We, we found ways to get people to come in. And basically, if you give people flexibility, uh, they give much more. And it's, it's a win-win. Um, yeah. It's a problem. You'll find that uh, a lot of mothers or mums-to-be when they're pregnant, they actually work twice as hard because yeah. there's a stigma that you have to prove yourself. So you will find that some of your hardest working employees are, are, are pregnant ones or mums return to work because, again, they feel this pressure to prove that they deserve their place. I think, again, there's a cultural piece, a communication piece there that needs to change that pressure. Yeah, yeah you, you, that does come up a, a bit in the conversation as well as, I think you used the expression guilt. Was it Absolutely. parenting guilt or...? or yeah, parental guilt um, is very it, real. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you can get it from this side, you can get it from that side, how you actually get that, get, get that balance, balance in the middle, and whether that's something that, that mothers are more likely to feel given the cultural environment versus fathers. Yeah, I do think mums do have more of a girl. I'm not saying that dads don't, but I think that, I don't know if it's historical, that the mum feels that their place is at home. I know I don't feel my place is at home, I feel that my place is in business. But as a mum, when your child's saying, I don't want you to go to work or I don't want you to travel to a different country, it's so hard where I think the dads are maybe a stronger character that they're, they're okay with that and they, they quite like the peace and quiet. But I know as a, a working mum, it's something I struggle with every single day. And I say to my children, do you like where you live? Do you like the nice holidays that you go on? Because if you do, that's the reason mommy has to work. But equally, the society that they've been born into, I need them to understand that daddy doesn't pay for all the bills and that that is half and half. And that the clothes that they wear, the holidays that they go on, mummy's paid half of that as well, because I think that will help them develop into a stronger woman as they grow. Fantastic. Okay. Um, any other final questions? I think we're, we're good. Uh, well, I'd just like to say a big thank you uh, to Laura for uh, coming all the way today and uh, giving us her experiences of this very important topic. I think it was a very fitting um, final um, uh, masterclass of the series that we've had. Uh, we've had 10 so far since the new school was formed back in October, and they've all addressed issues of business and society in one shape or form, uh, but we haven't covered this, this topic yet. Uh, so a massive thanks to uh, Laura. We have uh, videoed this session. I'm going to stop the video recording now. Uh, and, and Laura, I'll share that with you as well. Um, and thank you for everybody for on, uh, mostly online today uh, for attending um, and for um, uh, probing with those interesting questions too. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.